Hello everyone, welcome to the 225 Literary and Jury Charge. We're going to start off with some Latin and French words. I'll give you the words and then read the paragraph to you. Okay, so you're going to hear ex parte, a vinculo matrimony, per se, and post mortem. All right, here we go, ready? A vinculo matrimony means from the bonds of marriage or an absolute divorce. A vinculo matrimony is the same as a complete dissolution of the marriage. When only one side is present in an action at law, an ex parte proceeding takes place. Ex parte means without opposition. Per se means in, through, by itself, or of itself. Anything that possesses characteristics that are inherently attributed to it and not derived by statute is a crime per se. Post-mortem means after death. Post in Latin means after. A post-mortem examination of a corpse is conducted to determine the cause of death. Post-meridium means after midday. Postpartum means after childbirth. All right. Have some jury instructions for you. All right, here we go. Ready? All parties are present. Both trial counsel are present. The jury trial is present. Mr. Reynolds, the clerk, has the three separate questions that were submitted. I might indicate for the jury's information that the Calgic numbers are noted to the left at the top. Now, in connection with the questions, clarification of instructions, and drawing conclusions from circumstantial evidence, the instructions talk of reasonable interpretations. The question is reasonable by whose standards? This refers to... 3.92 for your information. In response to your first question, reasonable by whose standards, the court's answer is as follows. Reasonableness by judged by the jury standard and not reasonable as judged by any particular segment of society. My comments at the conclusion of answering some of the following questions may shed some light on what I have just said. I also should add that this is to be considered by the jury as an academic discussion regarding these words and their meaning as used in the instructions. The next series of questions refers principally to Calgic 3.92 and may have application to 3.93, but I took your question to be applied principally to Calgic 3.92. The statement is, if two issues are reasonable, rational, but one is more reasonable and rational, the question is, are we to treat them as equally reasonable and rational? The words reasonable and rational are interchangeable as used in this instruction. The instruction turns on reasonable interpretation versus rational interpretation or reasonable interpretation versus unreasonable interpretation. So the answer to your first question, are we to treat them as equally reasonable, rational? I will indicate as follows. Factually reasonable interpretations may not be of equal strength, but are equal in the eyes of the law and are so treated in the instruction. This is because the law does not attempt to measure the strength of reasonable interpretations. So the answer to your first question is yes. The second question continuing on, or can we judge that the more reasonable one is reasonable and the less reasonable one is unreasonable? The answer to that question is no. These questions are answered because the question refers to two reasonable or rational interpretations. That is why I attempted to point out the difference in the issues that are presented. The next question submitted appears to apply principally to Calgic 3.93. I think that was probably a little bit more on the challenging side because it was challenging for me to read. So usually when it's challenging for me to read, that's an indication that it's challenging for you to write. All right, so we're going to move right into some congressional record. And uh, this is a speech to the cabinet members. Okay, all right, here we go. Ready? Mr. Speaker, new presidents are entitled to select their cabinet members and they should be given a wide latitude in the choice of men and women who assist them. Unlike appointees to the judicial branch who enjoy a life tenure and are constitutionally independent from the executive branch, the cabinet members serve the president during his term of office. 
Cabinet members should have policies and goals that are similar to that of the president. I will vote to conform or confirm the nomination of David Paul Crenshaw as Secretary of the Treasury. Mr. Crenshaw has been involved in finance in both public and private endeavors. He was a prominent figure in Michigan for many years, working as corporate controller for General Motors and most recently as Director of Finance for the State of Michigan. Mr. Crenshaw has served on the Board of Regents of the University of Michigan, and he also worked closely as a consultant for 10 years to the Committee on New Project Appropriations for the State of Michigan. Mr. Crenshaw is a man of competence, integrity, and dedication. Mr. Crenshaw's record supports my opinion. In response to a number of questions which I and my colleagues put to Mr. Crenshaw at the hearing of his nomination, he did decline to give specific views on certain areas relative to the Federal Reserve and also to the questions regarding allocations of funds to special interest groups in the state of Michigan. Mr. Crenshaw declined to give details in these areas. The Committee of Cabinet Appointees was concerned about these questions and hopes Mr. Crenshaw will clear up these areas of ambiguity. Despite my reservation, I again affirm Mr. Crenshaw's nom nomination and look forward to working with him in the future. I have some fun facts regarding manufacturing and technology. And again, there are a lot of different fun facts that we're going to cover. And I think it's sometimes it might be a little challenging because they're jumping from one subject to the next, but it's it's good to, you know, that good practice because if it doesn't always follow a pattern, um, sometimes that can be challenging. So just write what you hear and try not to, you know, follow too much. Uh, just write what you hear, okay? Here we go. And these are all fun facts regarding manufacturing and technology. Ready? The character known as the Mad Hatter in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and the phrase Mad as a Hatter are both based on a tragic episode in manufacturing history. In the 18th and 19th centuries, hat makers used various chemicals in their work, among them mercury for curing felt. Mercury is a deadly poison, and the thousands of workers who handled this noxious substance developed pathological symptoms including kidney damage, anemia, inflammation of the gums, as well as insanity, known today as Hatter Syndrome. It is estimated that at a one time, more than 10% of all workers in the hat factories ended their lives insane. The United States uses 70 million tons of cement every year, approximately one-fifth of the cement used throughout the world annually. The variety of aluminum used to manufacture airplane wings is capable of withstanding loads of more than 90,000 pounds per square inch. Aluminum can be spun into a filament so fine that one and a half pounds of it could encircle the earth. More steel in the United States is used to make bottle caps than to manufacture automobile bodies. The human race, as we know it, has existed for approximately 50,000 years. This makes it approximately 800 lifetimes old, assuming a lifetime to be from 65 to 70 years. Of these 800 lifetimes, about 650 were passed by cave dwellers. Nearly all of the manufactured products, luxury items, and technological conveniences we enjoy today were invented or perfected within only the last five to seven lifetimes. When sulfur matches were first manufactured in the late 19th century, the workers who made them, usually young girls, licked the point of each match to make it stiff after dipping it in the requisite chemical solution. The solution contained radioactive zinc sulfide, which attacked the workers' teeth, jaws, and finally their entire bodies. No one knows how many thousands of young girls died of radioactive poisoning before they turned 30. It took Henry Ford's Motor Company seven years to manufacture one million automobiles. 132 working days after this figure was reached in 1924, the company had made nine million more cars. The first manufactured item ever exported from the United States was tar. It was sent from Jamestown, Virginia to the colony sponsors in England in 1608. There is some evidence that a cargo of sassafras has been sent previously from Cape Cod but this was a natural substance and not commercially produced. It is estimated that a plastic container can resist decomposition for as long as 50,000 years. It has been estimated that if one cubic kil kilometer of a mineral-rich asteroid were brought to Earth, it would be worth about $5 trillion. 
such an asteroid would provide the world with about 200 years supply of nickel and enough steel to run industries in every country for the next 15 years, given the current rate of use. And uh, just for your information, sassafras, that is a North American tree and uh, it was used um, for the, the root, uh, the dried root bark uh, used as a flavoring agent. So when they said that they, there was possibly a cargo of sassafras that had been sent from Cape Cod, that's what they were talking about. So interesting facts. I love this book. It's called uh, 2200 Fascinating Facts. All right. I'm going to give you some uh, jury charge, and uh, this the subject is murder. Okay, here we go. There is no duty upon the court to comment upon the evidence at all. All the court has to do is render a verdict of guilty or not guilty where people waive a jury and submit the matter to the court. I usually give to counsel and those people interested in the case, the court's reasoning, how the evidence appears to the court. As I say, I'm not going to attempt to commit or comment on all of the evidence. There is no duty on the court to comment on it at all. Suffice it to say that if the defendant's story is to be believed, he is not guilty of murder or even manslaughter. If his story is to be believed, he did not even cut the man. The man stabbed himself or got cut in the scuffle. If he is to be believed, I do not mind saying that to you, that it is hard to believe his story. His story is quite unbelievable. It does not ring true that this man can go into a bar two or three times and there be no objection by reason of his nationality. But on this particular occasion, the last time, the deceased comes up to him and calls him a vile name and starts to struggle with him with a knife. Now, counsel, things just don't happen that way. If that was all the evidence in the case, why, I would have to find the defendant not guilty, but I cannot believe his story. Now, on behalf of the state, one witness, the girl in the case, Rachel, was not very helpful, but it does appear that this defendant lived with this girl for over a year and that only a week or two previously she had left him, all right? So he contacts her there in the bar, according to her story, and according to her story, the defendant wanted to buy her a drink and she refused. So indefinite through her testimony was, it does show that there was some friction between the defendant and this Rachel. Now, on behalf of the other witnesses for the state, Mrs. Carter, she told a very clear and convincing story, which jibes with all of the facts in the case. She said that this defendant came there early in the afternoon and was quarreling and having trouble with Rachel. The deceased tried to get him to stop and finally put him out of the place sometime during the afternoon. Later, the defendant came back after having the trouble in the afternoon and again had some contact with the girl Rachel. When the deceased tried to get him to sit down at a table and behave himself or leave, he pulled out a knife. It appears very much to the court as if this defendant knew that he was going to have trouble there. He came back looking for trouble. In any event, if the fight started as he says it started, he certainly used more force than was necessary to defend himself. I will have to find this defendant guilty. I do not believe his story at all. I think the state has proved beyond all reasonable doubt that this defendant stabbed the deceased and brought about his death. The defendant says he did not mean to kill him. He did not mean to kill him, but he did mean to do him severe bodily harm, and death resulted from the injuries received by the deceased from this defendant. I will find the defendant guilty of manslaughter and sentence him to 10 years in the state prison. Counsel, I wish you would go out with him and explain to him. Just go out with him and explain to him what I said. I want him to understand. Okay. going to read um, just one section from uh, the psychological aspects of different killers and again I always say this but sometimes some of this is disturbing but we have to all get used to that especially if you want to work in court okay all right so we're on Kenneth Bianchi and Angino or I'm sorry, Angelo Buno, the Hillside Stranglers. There we go. Operating as a team, these two cousins terrorized Los Angeles between October 1977 and February 1978. 
committing a series of murders of women. Many of the victims were dumped on the sides of the Hollywood Hills, and the media dubbed the presumed killer the Hillside Strangler. The police, however, knew because of fluids and the positions of the bodies that two individuals were killing together. They withheld this information from the press. The first victim was a black prostitute, Yolanda Washington, who walked the Sunset Boulevard area. Her naked body was found on October 18, 1977, on a hillside near the Ventura Freeway. Her murder was published in the front news, or excuse me, in the front of the newspapers. Fifteen years, or I'm sorry, fifteen-year-old Judy Miller went missing on October 31st, 1977, in the Hollywood Boulevard area. She was a runaway, a drug user, and an occasional prostitute. Her body was found tossed in a flower bed in the local area. She had traces of adhesive tape on her mouth, wrists, and ankles. On November 6, 1977, the corpse of Lisa Teresa Caston was found in Glendale. Unlike the other two victims, Caston was not a runaway, drug user, or a prostitute. She was working at two jobs as a waitress and for her father's real estate company. On November 10, 1977, the body of Jill Barcombe, 18, a convicted prostitute, was found off of Mulholland Drive. Kathleen Robertson, 17, also part of the Hollywood Boulevard street scene, was found on November 17. Christina Reckler, 20, an art student, was found on November 20. On the same day, the police found the bodies of Sonia Johnson, 24, and Dolly Capita, 22. They were last seen at a shopping mall together. On November 23, Jane King, 28, a struggling actress, was found in the Los Feliz extension area. November ended with the discovery of Lauren Wagner, 18, a business school student whose strangled corpse was found off of Cliff Drive. There was a little doubt, or excuse me, there was little doubt that the murders were linked. Almost all of the bodies were bound, gagged, and handcuffed and tossed off the sides of the roads or highways, often at hill sites above Hollywood, out of the view of any houses. The police were also worried that the killers might have been police officers, in the past or somebody very familiar with police procedures. Virtually no evidence accompanied these corpses and they had been obviously carefully stripped to further reduce any possibility of forensic links. On December 15, 27-year-old prostitute Kimberly Martin was dispatched by her call girl agency to the Tara Marind Terrace Apartments in Hollywood. She had joined the agency because she feared exposing herself on the streets with the hillside strangler on the loose. Her body was found on a deserted lot near Los Angeles City Hall. When the police checked the apartment she had been dispatched to, they found it vacant and broken into. The killers had placed the call from a library phone nearby and then waited for their victim in the apartment. The last known victim was discovered on February 17, 1978, when somebody reported seeing a car halfway down a cliff off, a off Angeles Crest Highway. When police investigated the vehicle, they found in the trunk the body of Cindy Hudspeth, a 20-year-old student and a part-time waitress. Then the murder ceased as mysteriously as they began. So we'll stop there. There's more to this, but we'll stop there. Okay. All right. going to end with a story called, and this is on overcoming obstacles, soaring free. Okay. And this starts with, it is not easy to find happiness in ourselves and impossible to find it elsewhere. Here we go. A new home, a swimming pool in the backyard, two nice cars in the driveway, and my first child on the way. After nine years of marriage, I had it all, so or, or so I thought. I was only days away from delivering my first child when a conversation with my husband shattered the world I lived in. I want to be here for the baby, but I don't think I love you anymore, he said. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He had grown distant during my pregnancy, but I had related it to his fear and concern over becoming a parent. As I probed him for explanations, he told me he'd had an affair for five years prior and hadn't felt the same about me since. Thinking only of my baby and wanting so desperately to save my marriage, I told him I could forgive him for anything and that I wanted to work things out. But that final week before my son was born, 
was an emotional roller coaster ride. I was so excited about the baby, so scared that I was losing my husband, and feeling so guilty at times because I thought it was the baby's fault that all of this was happening. TJ was born on a Friday in July. He was so beautiful and so innocent. He had no idea what was happening in his mother's world. He was four weeks old when I discovered the real reason for his father's distance. Not only had he had an affair five years earlier, but he had started another affair during my pregnancy that was continuing. So TJ and I left the new home, the swimming pool, and all of my broken dreams behind when he was five weeks old. We moved into an apartment across town. I sank to the depths of depression that I hadn't known existed. I had never before experienced anything like the loneliness of spending hour after hour alone with a newborn infant. Some days the responsibility of it all overwhelmed me, and I would shake with fright. Family and friends were there to help, yet there were so many hours filled with the thoughts of broken dreams and despair. I cried often, yet I made sure that TJ never saw me cry. I was determined this wasn't going to affect him. From somewhere inside, I always found a smile for him. The first three months of TJ's life passed in a blur of tears. I went back to work and tried to hide from everyone what was going on. I was ashamed, though I don't know why. It was a Saturday morning when TJ was four months old that I hit the bottom. I had just had yet another emotional discussion with my husband, and he had stormed out of my apartment. TJ was sleeping in his crib, and I found myself sitting on the bathroom floor, curled up in a ball, rocking back and forth. I heard myself say out loud, I don't want to live anymore. After saying that, the silence was overwhelming. I believe God was there with me that day. After saying it, I sat there in silence for a while, letting the tears flow down my cheeks. I don't know how much time passed, but from somewhere within me arose a strength I hadn't felt before. I decided then and there to take control of my life. I was no longer going to give my husband the power to affect my life in such a negative way. I realized that by focusing so much of my attention on his weaknesses, I was allowing those weaknesses to ruin my life. That very same day, I packed a suitcase for TJ and myself, and we went to spend the weekend at my brother's house. It was the first trip I'd taken by myself with TJ, and I felt so strong and so independent. I remember on the two-hour drive, I laughed, talked, and sang to TJ all the way. It was during that trip that I realized what a savior my son had been to me during all of those months. Knowing that he was there every day and that he needed me had kept me going and given me a reason for getting out of bed in the morning. What a blessing he was in my life. From that day forward, I forced myself to focus on the confidence and strength that had brought me up from the bathroom floor. Having changed my focus to a positive thought, I couldn't believe the difference it made in my life. I felt like laughing again, and I enjoyed being around people for the first time in months. I began the process of discovering the individual I had kept hidden inside myself for so long, a process that I am still enjoying today. I had entered counseling shortly after TJ and I moved out of the house, and I continued in that counseling for several months after the day I felt I had hit bottom. When I no longer felt the need for her support and guidance, I remember the last question my counselor asked me before I left her office that day. What have you learned, she said. I didn't even hesitate in answering. I've learned that my happiness has to come from within. It is this lesson that I am reminded of every day that I long to share with others. I had made the mistake in my life of basing my identity on my marriage and all the material things surrounding that relationship. I've learned that I am responsible for my own life and happiness. When I focus my life on another person, I try to build my life and happiness around that person. I'm not truly living. To truly live, I need to let the spirit within me be free and rejoice in its uniqueness. It is in the state of being that the love of another person becomes a joy and not something to be afraid of losing. May your spirit be free and soar high. And her name is Lori Waldron. I love that story. All right, well, that concludes our literary and jury charge for the 225 class. Have a great day.